This aircraft will soon revolutionize 75 years of status quo in aircraft design. And it exists because Apple only supplied three-foot USB cables with its products. When most people think about their goods being transported around the globe, they envision massive container ships and cargo aircraft. The same aircraft the airlines use to carry passengers, reconfigured to deliver the items we use every day. This is not what people envision, and most people have never seen anything like this. So what are we looking at, and why is it about to cause a huge shift in aviation? After spending a few days with the Nautilus company in San Diego, California, I believe the blended wing body's time has come, and here's why. The tube and wing shape has been around seemingly forever, and it is a good one. Early in the Wright Brothers glider testing, before the world's first powered flight, they found that unlike birds, a vertical stabilizer was essential given the existing knowledge and available methods of control at the time. Along with a horizontal stabilizer and a center of gravity in front of the center of lift, they had found a passively stable system that would correct itself in flight without pilot input. As aircraft flew higher and began to require pressurization for pilot and passenger safety, the tube shape was found to be structurally ideal to resist the fatigue of endless pressurization cycles, along with various aircraft models being able to be created for different needs simply by adding or subtracting sections of the tubular fuselage. The shape has been exhaustively studied and few mysteries remain, cutting down on development time and costs for new aircraft. Flying wing aircraft were also developed concurrently but never gained the wide adoption that tube and wing aircraft achieved. Notable developments in flying wing aircraft were pioneered by the Horton brothers in Germany and Jack Northrup in the United States during World War II. Several factors held back the true flying wings from wider adoption, one being the more marginal yaw stability possible without a vertical stabilizer. The computer age and digital stabilization made the B-2 Spirit a viable configuration that was also ideal for stealth reasons due to fewer radar reflecting surfaces. People may disagree on what constitutes a true blended wing body, but for this video I will say that McDonnell Douglas came up with the modern concept of the blended wing body in the late 1990s. The blended wing body concept combined the internal volume of tube and wing aircraft with the low drag of flying wing aircraft. Importantly, it promised to be the future of commercial and transport aviation with significantly more internal volume than tube and wing aircraft for a given surface area. This promised to completely change the game. And yet, after 25 years of concept models and suggestions that blended wing bodies were just around the corner, nothing ever materialized. Every design has disadvantages, but nothing about the blended wing body seemed to be a showstopper or negate the incredible advantages. So what is going on? Before sitting down for an interview with Alexei Matyshev, the CEO and co-founder of Nautilus whose company is currently constructing the world's first production blended wing body, I had the chance to look around the San Diego wind tunnel and see the subscale test article in the wind tunnel on the last day of testing. I'm going to turn things over to Alexei as he gives us an in-depth look at the aviation revolution quietly unfolding in Southern California. They'll paint it with paintbrushes and then what they'll do is they'll actually run over to here and they're going to turn the wind on. And so the kerosene and the talcum powder moves back. And then after that, it, uh, the kerosene evaporates. So it actually uh, stops when like, the flow is actually visualized. Gotcha. So you were saying these are the areas where you have complete separation? Yeah, so we have two elevons for pitch control, an inboard elevon and an outboard elevon over here. This is our aileron. And uh -huh. So we see a little bit of separation. This is post-stall, so as expected, uh, which is captured by the wet uh, china clay over here. But you can see the fuselage is almost entirely attached. Uh, the junction over here is very complex between the wind and the root. The nacelles are entirely attached. The vertical tails are attached. So the fuselage is very, very clean. Now when you get now when you're at a lower angle of attack, I mean, are you getting almost 100%? Um... Well, this is kind of like a, a tunnelism is what we say. So you usually have the prop plane over here, which will actually suck the air and keep the air attached. So mm -hmm. in real life, something like this would actually never exist. Yeah, okay. And this got added here for what? Yeah, so we were just experimenting and playing around in the tunnel. We're calling this like a body fence. It's just a, a thinking of, you know, what could you do to make it a little bit better? We see some change in uh, the configuration as far as the CL max values of the airplane, but again, this is something that does not have to live on the airplane for it to be successful. Mm -hmm. So this is the last kind of couple of days of the tunnel, so we're just throwing out ideas of what could happen or what we could do to make incremental more improvements in the last little bit of the configuration. 
Okay. And then obviously this is a post-stall situation, so we see two vortices developing here and here, and you can very clearly see that they're essentially coming off of the kink at the leading edge on the fuselage junction. Uh -huh. So uh, again, this is a post-stall situation, but you can see that the wing is mostly attached, but this is the beginning of a stall. And this whole, this whole model weighs how much? It's about 500 pounds. It's a 10th scale representation of the first airplane. Yeah. If you are wondering how the airstream in the tunnel is created, essentially this giant turbine, which sits adjacent to the section where the test vehicle is, generates a high velocity stream of air that is turned 90 degrees by these gates and then another 90 degrees to enter the test section. The air is straightened out by this honeycomb structure before it meets the test vehicle. So the model sits up top over there and that's what they're about to remove. There is a, a strut that goes down into this and then there is a here is where there's three forces that are essentially uh, taken out. So we get lift, drag, and then we have all the rolling moments. So these three pillars have hydraulic load cells in the uh, All the forces get reactive, turned into digital signal, and then sent upstairs into the actual control room where we sit as customers. And then we actually would plot out the data. So after a, t a run is done, um, within like a couple of minutes, we would actually have the full data already from the run. And so we would plot it up, we would interpret it, and then make modifications as we see fit. Uh, but these are the, the original three balances. I'm sorry, this is the original balance, but these are the original three hydraulic load cells. And a lot of these companies, of course, already don't exist. So every single thing that needs to be done here is pretty much original handwork if it needs to be redone. After the wind tunnel testing was wrapped up, I had the chance to ask Alexei questions ranging from aerodynamics to the economics and industry surrounding this game-changing design. I found the answers to my questions incredibly interesting and came away convinced that the blended wing body's time has arrived. I believe you will find our discussion very informative and insightful. So without further commentary from me, here is Alexei Matushev. For most people, if they were to see a blended wing body fly over, it would be the first time they had ever seen such an aircraft. What makes the blended wing so special, and why is there a good chance it will be a big part of the aviation future? So uh, the blended wing body, um, you know, it's got a long history. I think, you know, where it started out was within McDonnell Douglas. Um, I think it was the mid to late 1980s that NASA really wanted to explore new concepts. Uh, and I think everybody had, you know, the thinking back at that time that, you know, airplanes really haven't changed from the traditional tube and wing unless you were doing something in the military. And so there was a lot of exploration and new configurations on the military side, whereas not so much on the passenger. And, um, you know, prices, fuel prices were climbing as well. There's a lot of uh, challenges within the industry. And they thought that new technology research would really benefit um, kind of the future of passenger travel. And, um, you know, the big kind of, uh, there's two really big advantages of the blender wing body. There's a reduction in drag, so aerodynamic drag. Um, it's uh, depending on who you ask and which company you, uh, you talk to, it's between uh, 10 to 20 percent. Uh, obviously, we have our wind tunnel test that shows different numbers for different configurations, but it's within that ballpark. Um, and then the second piece of it is just more volume centric. So uh, for passenger travel, it usually means that you can actually put more passengers inside of it. So you're generating more um, revenue seed per mile. I think that's the current metric that they use. So for the same amount of weight of airplane, you can put more passengers in it, actually capitalize more on those tickets and create better revenue while still reducing gas emissions and the CO2 aspect of it. Um, kind of the same story with cargo, which is where we are at. So you can fit more boxes within it so you can actually reduce the amount of, you know, cost of uh, one kilogram to transport over a certain distance. But those are the two primary advantages within the blended wing body. And last time we talked, weren't you saying something? It was almost an advantage because so many of the boxes, like that, so much of the cargo that you're carrying, it just takes up so much volume, but there isn't a lot of weight in it. And that's also another, like you're able to carry more of that high volume, but low weight. So what really happened in air freight, uh, circa 1996 and um, going into the, the new millennium was that e-commerce started to become a big driver. It wasn't as big of a driver back then, but the trend started to kind of really uh, really show itself and it was an exponential trend within air freight where we started to see that the densities of cargo really drop because people were buying online um, the Amazon you know two-day prime service started to come about so boxes needed to travel faster and of course you know the the way to do that was a lot of it was by air freight 
And so there was this, all of a sudden, this magical trend that appeared overnight uh, within the air freight industry. It's uh, freighters today, they actually cube out on volume instead of topping out on weight. So there's still a lot of weight, what we call like usability left in the airplane, but at the same time, you're so limited by just the, the physical tube of the airplane that you can't really allow more cargo to be put inside of it. And so, you know, as we talked about the blender wing body previously, the configuration with the blender wing body, uh, you can, you know, carry about 50 to 60 percent more volume for that same weight. And so now, all of a sudden, the, the realities of what the e-commerce densities match what the maximum takeoff weight of the airplane is. And so the, there's now um, um, a full utilization of these types of airframes in the blended wing body, which you don't typically see in the, the Boeings and the Airbuses or the tubes and wings of the world. How did you even like stumble upon that? <laughs> so, uh, well, the, the trend within e-commerce is something that you know we really didn't think about in, until uh, just talking to customers, really. So we really missed the mark when we started Nautilus. We thought that uh, what people were looking for is autonomy. And uh, talking to our customers, what they really were interested in is a, a more volume-centric aircraft with uh, autonomy as, as kind of a carrot, or like the next evolution. And um, so honestly, just, just talking with industry and, and really listening to them is really what brought us back to the blender wing body configuration which really gives the efficiencies and the value proposition to our customers today. You led advanced projects before. What made you branch out to start your own blended wing-based autonomous aircraft company? So, uh, yeah, I did uh, work a lot of advanced projects before and um, a lot of sleepless nights. And I actually got out of the aerospace industry uh, right before I started Nautilus. And um, I started an industrial design group. We went through Kickstarter successfully twice. And we were doing things like iPhone cables. So back in those days, iPhone cables were this big, three feet. So we were one of the first companies in the world to make them six feet, actually more usable. Uh, we were doing things like iPad amplifiers, uh, you know, consumer electronics. We went into chargers, uh, got into textiles, got into glassware for a little while. And what really excited me about those projects is uh, when you think about an airplane program, I mean, it can last a decade. So when you think about a career in the aerospace industry, you might touch three to four airplanes uh, in your career, if that. And so uh, this iteration and this fast product development that we were doing in the industrial design group, as well as um, just having your own business, obviously, uh, it kind of you know, created an opportunity that I knew that I, I never wanted to go back into aerospace initially. I wanted to stay there. But we just stumbled on this really big fundamental problem when taking a lot of the, the cargo. So we were doing manufacturing over in Asia the Shenzhen, Shanghai areas, of course, in China, and then bringing our product over to the United States to sell to consumers and then ship it out globally. But we had really two main pinch points. The first pinch point was we always had to split up cargo like 10% by air freight, which we would lose our lunch on as far as profit margins, and then the rest of it would go by ocean. Well, air freight was about three to five days delivery, and then ocean was a month at best sometimes. They wouldn't even give you a tracking number because it just depends on so many variables. And so we were always frustrated with that pain point. Um, and then the other pain point was uh, we had an e-commerce online store. And uh, about 70% of our uh, customers were in the United States, but about 30% and growing were international. And so in this example, they would be purchasing this iPhone cable, which would be $30, let's say, from us. And then it would cost $30 to ship overseas into Europe or somewhere else, or even back to China. And so. Well, we had this, the customers were always complaining to us, is why is the, the, the price of shipping so expensive? And there was only two ways, like I could commoditize it, and it'd be $3 as an example. It would be sent by ocean freight, and sometimes it would never even get there. But then, of course, you ship it by air freight. Again, the same whole duopoly was really a cutting down our, our um, international sales. And so the same problem occurred on both sides of the supply chain, and we started to think about it, uh, you know, more in terms of how would you fix something like this. At that point as well, uh, something like a phrase was the fifth mode of transportation came about in Silicon Valley. Hyperloop was the embodiment of that. Um, you know, how do you take this heavy cargo from ocean freight but give it the, the speed of air freight right through these tubes? Well, the problem with Hyperloop uh, that still might exist today is the infrastructure costs associated with it. And so um, we thought, how could you take that whole idea, though, and package it in a way that is uh, really something that we are really good at doing. And that's how really the blender wing body Nautilus concept came about. It's uh, you know taking the timeliness of air freight, but reducing the cost to the point that you're starting to become a commodity.
I find that hilarious. You're like making cables, but you're also the person that can solve the shipping, <laughs> the shipping problem via via building a whole new genre of aircraft. <laughs> yeah, but it has to start somewhere, right? <laughs> a little overqualified. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot more fun. <laughs> The major industry companies have put forth various blended wing body concepts over the years, but nothing has materialized. The reason I usually see cited being cabin pressurization issues. What is Nautilus doing different? Um, so there is really uh, two, I think, large is Well, there's, there's three issues within the blended wing body concept from an engineering perspective. Uh, the first one is that you kind of hinted upon is cabin pressurization. So uh, it's a lot easier to pressurize a tube and you know not create a lot of structure behind it. Um, it's just it's a perfect pressure vessel, a circular pressure vessel. Um, the second uh, thing is the egress problem. So now that you've stuffed so many passengers into this triangular section, I think there's a law, I believe it's 90 seconds, that you have to evacuate the cabin out of the entire blender wing body. And so now that you have so many more people, and then the aisles were specifically centered down the center of the airplane, and then they had to run up uh, more distance to get to the, the egress points on the airplane, that created some challenges there as well. But really what broke the blender wing body design um, was the fact that if you think about it, if you have a triangular fuselage uh, and then you have passengers uh, sitting on the outboard on the outside towards the window seat, as the airplane banks, uh, they experience higher g-forces than the people in the center aisle. And the bigger you made the, make the blender wing body, you know, the wider it is. And so a lot of these g-forces start coming to play in two g's on a, just a normal turn for an approach is not that comfortable. It's not your G limiting the airplane in lateral. And so, you know, it was just the third thing that really broke uh, the idea of a blended wing body large passenger aircraft. I think especially within like the industry circles, I would say. Are you, are you guys even pressurizing the cabin in a cargo? Yeah, it depends on our products. Uh, so as an example, the first uh, like a 19,000 pound regional cargo aircraft, we're flying somewhere close to eight to 15,000 pounds. So there's no autonomy, I mean, there's no pilot on board. Um, there's no need for a pressurized cabin. I mean, we're, you know, usually you would switch to oxygen about 12,000 because of, of everything. But cargo, the, really the big problem with pressurization, unpressurization is aerosols. And so, um, you know, let's imagine you're like a huge integrator such as a FedEx or UPS. I mean, you're, you're basically stuffing boxes and products into these containers. If you were to un- uh, fly and pressurize like at 30,000 feet, which would be our second or third products, um, fly with traffic, there's an aerosol can inside of it. It'll literally be like a pneumatic bomb within the cargo bay section. So uh, you have to pressurize, but we don't have to pressurize as high because we don't have occupants on board. So we can keep cabin levels somewhere, you know, down to uh, maybe 17 or 16,000 feet instead of it bringing it down to something that was closer to eight to 10,000 feet. So with cargo, there's advantages to it, but you can't completely unpressurize the cabin because of aerosol products. It's one of those things that uh, really magically got easier the moment you stopped talking about passengers and letter wing bodies and, and focus on cargo. I mean, nobody cares on the outside windows. Cargo doesn't you know, care if it's 2Gs or something like that. So that goes away. There's no egress problem for cargo, and there's no longer a pressurization problem. So all the big things that in a passenger world would have kind of killed the blender wing body in engineering circles, you know, if you think about it from a cargo perspective and just focus on that market, it, it magically just, the problem gets way easier. So Nautilus already tested a 2,200 pound vehicle, which I had to look up is about the size of a fully loaded Cessna 172. That's a pretty big test model. What is Nautilus going to fly next? It's a 19,000 pound 85-foot wingspan aircraft, uh, which is being produced at our Brown facility about 15 minutes away from our office. Already being produced? Yeah, so the, the assembly is already underway, starting with the vertical tails. Uh, we're actually building a mock-up, something the industry calls an Iron Bird. So it's a steel weldment assembly where we start installing certain systems and subcomponents of the aircraft system. So, uh, you know, we test the systems, uh, the subcomponents, the autopilot, all together on the Iron Bird make sure everything is talking and works together. And then once the structure is built, we take the Iron Bird and we integrate it into the, the, the prototype, actually. So it, certain things that are already well ahead of on our way, such as subsystem development, as an example, and vertical tail construction is already being done over there. So this is the small-scale version of it. 
It's a twin turboprop, uh, twin tail, uh, all carbon fiber airframe. And it'll fly here in about 26 months. What are some of the main hurdles you faced in using unmanned technology given the current regulatory structures in place around the globe? So I think there's a huge misconception about unmanned technology uh, in the small drone space and what it actually is in the large drone space. Um, not the large drone space, the large aircraft space. Uh, so if you look at the history of aviation, um, we had the first autopilot, which is a Sperry autopilot. First flight was 1903. First ferry was installed in 1913. So autopilot technology has existed for over 100 years plus now, and we've been flying on it regularly, right? Um, and so even if you think about a commercial airliner today, you know, there's a takeoff, but as soon as the, the, the ceiling hits or the, they hit past the 1,000 uh, uh, foot altitude, they turn on the autopilot, and everything is already pre-programmed, and away we go. And then they might turn off the autopilot at the very last minute, or they will execute an auto land. So um, we have this capability, we have this technology. It's already integrated in our airspace on a global level, right? And um, the only thing that's really the Nautilus is changing is we're taking the pilot out of the cockpit where they have the ability to press buttons and take over manual control, and we're moving them into a ground control station. So instead of having that pilot on board, we're just creating that extra tether, if that makes sense. But almost executing the same task as he would in a cockpit. And uh, that's kind of like, in our thinking, is, is the next natural progression. Um, and that's the way the FAA and other entities are approaching it on a global level. Uh, so as an example for our first prototype, uh, fully unmanned certification into the national aerospace existed in 2013. So the regulatory environment has been around for nine years. It's just a question of, you know, when is a company such as a Nautilus or somebody else comes along with a product that is actually capable of being certified through that uh, threat regulatory environment. And then on a global level, there's already been autonomous flights in civil airspace in China, as an example. There's already been practices done in Africa, practices done in the Caribbean. Um, and so far, there's been not any crashes. So even at this cutting edge of environment and regulatory, I would say, trending, um, is, it's, it's proven to be a very successful approach. And when you think about it, too, if you look at the, the space of um, accident investigation in general aviation and commercial, 95% plus of it is pilot error. So it's the same thinking in cars. It's, how, it's not a question of this will happen. It's how quickly it can make it happen to really bring the safety record of aviation to a new kind of level. But at the same time, too, you know, leaving space, uh, you know, for cargo, cargo is not really the sexiest thing to fly. You know, most uh, captains and whatnot would want to fly passengers. And so as aviation or airline traffic keeps booming to the right, the lack of pilots is becoming, I mean, more and more apparent. And so why don't we let cargo fly itself and let, you know, the other pa uh, pilots really focus on what, what they're there to do is create that safety net for passengers in the cockpit if anything does go wrong, that they're able to take command of the aircraft. What has been your most challenging technical hurdle in creating a globally capable unmanned system? And at this point, would you say developing a manned or unmanned aircraft of this magnitude is easier? I think unmanned, for sure. Uh, I mean, just even thinking about uh, some of the systems that we were talking about last week, uh, you know, we don't have to do uh, seats. Seats need to be dynamically tested for crashworthiness. Now we have a pressure vessel, let's just say we might need that. Now we need an oxygen system for those uh, passengers as well. Now we need a more uh, stringent fire suppression system. Now we got to think about egress and doors. Do we have enough doors and, uh, you know, uh, penetrations through bulkheads there? Are the, literally the actual doors big enough? Uh, things like that. And then, um, yeah, when you really think about how much really goes, into uh, as far as weight, cost, and thinking about keeping a passenger safe, is it, there's a lot to it. And I mean, of course, everybody will tell you well, that's why aviation's got a, such a good safety record, of course. But when you take away the, the man versus unmanned side and we don't have to create that protection around those passengers, there's really only a couple of subsystems on the airplane that are truly complex. As an example, of course, the autopilot system, the flight control system, and then um, the telemetry ground control station. But those systems are something that um, when they start talking to each other, it's so it, it, it's not that you have separate discrete systems that you have to make it work, but you're, it's really just you know focusing on the autonomy portion. So in my opinion, it is way easier to design an autonomous aircraft than it is a manned aircraft.
In 2015, you stated that Nautilus would be used for overseas routes and avoid commercial airports for safety reasons. Is this still the plan, or have systems evolved enough over time to reconsider that approach? So when uh, we started the company in 2015, we really uh, didn't know about this document, which came out in 2013. Um, so that's why we stayed away from all that, and that's why the statement was made. Um, obviously, as soon as we saw the 2013 document, as far as certification into uh, of optionally an unmanned aircraft, we knew that we could then fly into uh, regulated airports, powered airports, and fit directly into the national airspace system. And so that's kind of the permission that we needed from the FAA to really take that next step and create a concept of operation that really meets the demands of our customer. Uh, with that being said, I think a lot of customers, because this is a new technology for them, um, I know some of the routes that there's been conversations about, they want to start with rural routes. But that's also great, too, if you think about it, because um, you know, our products really do shine on those rural routes where you know, either you send a truck or you send one of our first products, which is a feeder aircraft. So it, it naturally even makes sense for our customers to start operations in rural environments and then move over into more, um, I'll call them congested airspaces. And then as soon as you hit our uh, flagship products, I mean, those products are overseas products. They literally would fly into like Shenzhen, turn around, or Hong Kong, and fly directly to Anchorage uh, to interface with cargo there and then go back. So, um, you know, a lot of the products meant for cargo, they really don't fly into very congested airports uh, for the most part. I mean, if you think about um, the operations for uh, World Port for UPS, that's in Louisville, Kentucky. So Louisville, Kentucky doesn't see a lot of passenger traffic, but there's a heck of a lot of freight traffic there. So even just naturally, the way that the cargo was built up in, along these hubs is um, they tend to be rural in nature in any way. What do you expect to find when tunnel testing a subscale model that you wouldn't find doing CFD on a full scale model? When there is a data discrepancy between the two, how do you resolve that? So, uh, you know, my thinking as an engineer, especially in aerodynamics, we always talk about the rule of threes. Um, and you want to make sure that the data sets that you have are either, uh, are always odd. They're never even. Because typically when you have two even data sets, there's always going to be a discrepancy. And you have to choose which data set is correct. So as an example, um, you can go in and you can start doing a lot of computational fluid dynamics at the very beginning of the program just to get kind of in the right direction. And then uh, as soon as you have a wind tunnel testing, you kind of like, oh, holy smokes, man. Well, CFD doesn't match wind, wind tunnel. Which one is more correct? And from my experience, of course, you would say typically wind tunnel is more correct uh, just because the model is more high fidelity. Uh, what happens in the CFD world, just taking a little bit of a step back to it's um, the CFD codes are only as strong as the individual who ran them. So uh, there's still a lot of things about uh, black magic type of approaches is the way you mesh airplanes. You really are taking a stab at a lot of these things. You can't just hit run on a CFD solution and expect to get correct results. So there's all sorts of finicky things that really create experience. And then the CFD tool is also being benchmarked to more empirical data such as, you know, wind tunnel testing or flight test, uh, testing. But anyway, so you kind of have those two data sets. And at the end of the day, there's only one data set that actually matters. It's the airplane that you build in flight test. And then you, as engineers, you always take a look back. Well, heck, man, you know, CFD didn't match flight test and wind tunnel, you know, didn't match flight test either. But here we have this airplane that's built and designed. Obviously, we want to get as close as we can to that flight test data. But when you build this, the first airplane, especially a prototype, there's going to be manufacturing breaks last minute decisions that were made that were not made you know, a year and a half ago, a year in wind tunnel configuration. So naturally, airplanes just evolve through the data sets. And I've even heard stories that um, a second airplane is built and it doesn't even match the first airplane. Or you have a flight test program with three airplanes and none of them match. So at the end of the day, we all you know, trying to get to the right answer, but just an expectation of tools that they all always have their limitations. And at the end of the day, you pick one truth and always make sure that hopefully you have an odd number so you always kind of, hopefully two of the data sets agree together enough that you can figure out where the one truth really lies. But I, I don't believe in just CFD alone and then wind tunnel alone. Um, you kind of have to create a story and a narrative, but hopefully you always are trying to work with uh, an odd number of, of data tools instead of any. You said there was like only three major ones, I think. In yeah. So, uh, you know, I think uh, wind tunnels are very underrated still, I think, especially in academia, uh, undergrad and grad. There's just this renewed focus on these uh, computational tools. And um, the thinking is just they're more easily accessible, uh, which is true. So, you know, you could 
design something in CAD and have something running in CFD within an hour, right? Um, when you, you think about wind tunnel testing, well, there's only a handful of wind tunnel tests in the United States. There's really three. You have to book time to them. Um, you know, that'll maybe six to eight months ahead. A typical wind tunnel test will run you a million dollars. The model itself is going to be a quarter of a million dollars. So I think there's just this huge industry push to, to move away from this, what they call archaic infrastructure, into more of these, what they believe is the truth codes, like computational fluid dynamics. But within even computational fluid dynamics, there's you know, over hundreds of codes, and none of them complete, like, completely seem to agree on the same problems. Even like the benchmarking that people do like within NASA, they get close, but you know, again, they never line up on each other directly. I remember there's this one conversation we had within a company. Um, you know, we were going to replicate the entire wind tunnel test in CFD. And uh, we did kind of the math behind what that might take, and it was going to take us like over a year and a half of just running servers completely nonstop. And we needed a team of something that was like four, you know, aerodynamicists just cranking out CAD and all these CFD meshes 24-7. And I think the, the price ended up being like three to four million dollars, right? And so, I mean, we looked at that price tag, figured it out, and it's like, why don't we spend the million dollars and get the entire data set done in like three weeks? And so there's still a lot of value, I think, in wind tunnel testing where you can go in there and really generate a lot of data really quick. And if there are problems, I mean, in the olden days, uh, people would cut tails. They would build new you know, vertical fins. They would lop off fuselages. I mean, a lot of these models that were pretty robust that you could even like put China clay, not China clay, but uh, clay, like a modeling clay on the airplane. And you can you know, talk about what a, like a belly fairing might look like or what if we change this and here and get the data really quickly. So in a lot of ways, I think wind tunnels still, uh, although they're viewed kind of as an archaic institution, there's so much value for them still to this day. And it's really kind of a shame that, uh, you know, NASA started to decommission a lot of their wind tunnels. Um, so one of the l largest wind tunnels in the world at one point was at NASA Ames. So the space shuttle actually did uh, testing over there, but that's been used as too expensive. Nobody uses it, so it's being decommissioned. And I feel like those are national assets, which I think could push the limits of aviation, but we just start to see different approaches, and I think a lot of it stems from academia. What would you like people to know about Nautilus or blended wing bodies that we have not already covered? I think uh, people naturally get scared of new configurations, so if it looks anything different than what they are usually board, which like on, on a normal airline flight, which is a tube and wing aircraft, people just naturally get very nervous. Um, you know, the blended wing body studies that were done with NASA as an example, they I think they did a good job of scaring a lot of industry about needing really complex flight control systems for the aircraft. But they really pushed the limits, and it, I think they wanted it to be a flight control study. Um, and so there was loss of flight was always tied to autopilot. But if you know, you look at the wind tunnel testing that we've done. We've done three wind tunnel tests today, gobs of gobs of hours of CFD. You, you, these uh, configurations are stable, and just because they look different, they fly like as normal as any other airplane in, in, that I've ever worked on. So I think it's just, uh, it, if it looks new, it doesn't necessarily mean it's different. And if it looks new, it's not necessarily scary or it, it's more as, risk, as risky as people think it is, I think, is what I'm trying to say. I would like to thank Alexei and the team at Nautilus for their time. After this interview, for many reasons, it is my opinion that blended wing bodies have finally arrived and will have a large impact on aviation as we know it. Let me know in the comments if you agree or not, and why. I'm interested to know your thoughts.